Now, in a sense, the whole process of movie making is one big long con. You're persuading an audience that the two hour procession of heavily edited scenes you've assembled out of footage that was shot in the wrong order actually represents a single coherent narrative. After all, a successful con relies on the Stooges' suspension of disbelief. Just like a really good story. That's something the legendary Alfred Hitchcock definitely understood. The master of the mean practical joke on set, Hitchcock knew that a quality trick, whether the intricate plot to a thriller or a prank played on a friend, needed to be set up like a stage illusion. Of course, Hitch's practical jokes were limited to the poor saps that he worked with. He only ever played with the audience by inserting those infamous blink and you'll miss it directorial cameos into his movies. Other directors, however, However, have taken it further, playing games with the crowd at home, using their platform as the masterminds behind the movies to elaborately prank the world. So with that in mind, I am Gareth, this is What Culture, and here are 10 crazy tricks directors try to pull on audiences. Number 10. Audience Participation – The Truman Show when Peter Weir brought The Truman Show to worldwide rave reviews in 1998, he had no idea how prescient his movie was going to be. No one did, really. Contemporary reality television like The Real World was considered a trashy cable television fad. Big Brother was at least a year away from being a reality. The story of Truman Burbank, an orphan raised by a TV network in an artificial environment, whose every unsuspecting moment was broadcast to millions of fascinated viewers around the world, The Truman Show was the shape of things to come, foretelling the rise of the world's obsession with the not-so-private lives of others. Weir knew that his project was satire, however, and had an idea about how to turn the tables on the cinema-going audience and confront them with their own complicity. His plan involved taking selected theatres and placing a camera near the screen, with the audience themselves in the frame. At a specific point in the movie, the projectionist would cut to a feed coming directly from the camera and for a moment the crowd would be confronted with themselves, staring at themselves, staring at themselves, on and on into recursive infinity. Sadly, the idea proved practically challenging and financially impractical, and Weir reluctantly set it to one side. But for a while, The Truman Show was set to be an even more groundbreaking work, cinema morphing into performance art and back again. Now that would have been a very, very strange cinema experience. But I've got a question for you. What has been your favourite ever experience at the cinema? You let me know in the comments section down below. Now back to the video. Number 9. Possessed Chairs – The Tingler if you know anything about the history of the cinema, it's quite likely you've heard of William Castle, the notorious producer and director of 50s and 60s B-movie horror like House on Haunted Hill, 13 Ghosts and The Tingler, and his endlessly inventive promotional gimmicks. There was Homicidal's Fright Break, where patrons too scared to watch the rest of the movie got a refund, provided they perform the walk of shame out of the theatre and sign a certificate of cowardice. Jam there was Mr. Sardonicus, where the cinema audience got to vote on the eventual fate of the villain. That's pretty cool. But none are as infamous as the prank associated with the Tingler in 1959. Castle's movie was about a parasite that attached itself to the spinal cord and fed on fear, making its victim's spines tingle. He purchased old World War II aeroplane wing de-icing motors and fitted them to the undersides of certain seats in theatres showing the movie, and hired plants to melodrama dramatically faint and be carried from the room during the film's climax, which was set in a movie theatre. Vincent Price's voice then warned the audience that a tingler was loose in their theatre, followed by the projectionist activating the buzzers, jolting certain members of the audience from their seats, and freaking everyone else out around them. We call that 4DX today. Number 8. Green is Good – Wall Street A critical, if not a financial hit in 1987, Oliver Stone's drama Wall Street exploited the excess and empty arrogance of the 80s to create one of cinema's all-time great villains, unscrupulous financer Gordon Gekko. Michael Douglas won an Oscar for his performance in the role, and it's justifiably considered one of Stone's best works. Despite the realism of the plot and action, however, there is a secret hidden deep inside this movie. Gekko himself told Charlie Sheen's bud and the audience that what he does is, well, BS, an illusion if you will. Well, Stone also hid an illusion inside the prince itself. 
ensuring that a constant orange shade overlaid Wall Street, saturating the New York skyline. When your eyes are inundated with a specific color and you switch to something neutral, like a long blink or a white piece of paper, you'll immediately see that color's contrasting shade, as your fatigued retina compensates for the overload. Orange's contrasting shade? Well, it's green, of course. Stone was shoving money in the audience's face throughout the entire movie without them knowing anything about it. Number seven, cake is a made-up drug, brass eye. 2019 saw the release of The Day Shall Come, writer-director Chris Morris's marvelously dark and hilariously vicious satire on homeland insecurity, law enforcement, and terrorism. Like his first film, The Astonishing Four Lions, The Day Shall Come is an inventively caustic black comedy skewering targets other filmmakers would be too scared to even touch. The creation of a man with absolutely no F-words to give. Of course, if you'd been following Morris's career, you would know that already. Morris began as a radio DJ, losing almost every job he took due to the on-air pranks he'd pull on the hapless audience and the D-list celebrities he'd persuade to be interviewed. He seamlessly moved to comedy after that, the linchpin of BBC's The Day Today and Brass Eye, satires on news programming and current affairs respectively. Yet he still found time to mercilessly lampoon the great and the good, memorably persuading various celebrities that a drug named Cake was plaguing the streets of Britain, that paedophiles have more DNA in common with crabs than with humans, or that an elephant at a Berlin zoo had stuck her trunk into her own anus in protest at captivity. A victim of zoocosis. Utterly fearless, surreal, and bloody brilliant, Chris Morris is a national treasure. Number six, flat out lies, F for fake. The legendary Orson Welles is as famous for a prank as he is for his magnificent contributions to cinema and art. Structured in the style of a radio news bulletin, his 1938 adaptation of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds was introduced as a drama. Nonetheless, it still managed to fool the program's small audience into thinking an alien invasion was actually occurring, although reports of a nationwide panic were subsequently exaggerated. But Wells' interest in illusion ran deep, baby. He had a lifelong interest in magic, claiming in a 1955 documentary to have been taught as a child by Harry Houdini himself. Whether this was true or not has never been confirmed. Indeed, a story Wells tells about Houdini in the same documentary is manifestly untrue, invented by Wells for the camera. 1973's documentary drama F for Fake was the culmination of Wells' love of trickery. Ostensibly about professional art forger Elmer de Horry, the film delves deep into questions of authenticity and authorship. However, many of those that were interviewed, Horry's biographer Clifford Irving, for example, were also forgers, making statements which Wells must have known were untrue. Not only that, but the film was carefully edited to create the illusion that unrelated slices of footage were shot in real time. In a posthumous BBC documentary, Orson Welles' Stories from a Life in Film, Wells stated that everything in that film was a trick rather appropriate from a man who spent his whole life turning trickery into art. Cheers for watching this video today, you lovely person you. Now go and hit that subscribe button down below and you will get more of this stuff in your life. That is no trick, trust me, trust me, I would not do that to you. Now back to the video. Number five, a year long method, I'm still here. One of the biggest celebrity stories of like a decade or so ago, featured celebrated dramatic actor Joaquin Phoenix and his sudden inexplicable retirement from acting to pursue a career in, uh, in hip-hop. At a charity event in 2008, Phoenix was reported to have told the assembled media of his new career, and over the next 12 months, he would write, rehearse, and perform as though this was indeed the case. Growing a large, unsightly beard and appearing in public as a shuffling, mumbling shadow of his former self. The consensus that Phoenix was in the middle of a prolonged breakdown was crystallized by his February 2009 appearance on Letterman. You know the one. During that year, Phoenix had been followed by a film crew recording everything that he experienced during his break. From acting or from reality, take your pick. The result was I'm Still Here, a 2010 documentary directed by Phoenix's friend Casey Affleck. However, sometime after the release of the movie, it was revealed to have been a fiction. Phoenix had remained in character in public for a solid year to produce the movie itself, a mockumentary satirizing celebrity culture and reality television. As Phoenix explained on his return appearance, 
appearance on Letterman in 2010. Although Affleck later claimed that there was no intention to trick anyone, this is manifestly untrue, isn't it? Even home video footage in the film of Phoenix as a child with his family was faked, recorded by actors in Hawaii and treated to appear decades old. This, this right here is why I have trust issues. Number four, everything was real, the Blair Witch Project. In 1999, the internet was still in short trousers. Long before the advent of fake news, the information superhighway was a trusted source. If it was online, it was real, right? Oh, how little we knew. In those pre-social media days, that is what people really believed. So when Daniel Myrick and Eduardo Sanchez introduced the online marketing of their new horror movie as though it represented real events, they didn't really run into a lot of resistance. The Blair Witch Project was a found footage movie, the progenitor of the genre. Myrick and Sanchez had always found documentaries on the paranormal scarier than traditional horror movies, so their film was shot on a shoestring budget as though by the protagonists on camcorders. The idea being that this footage had been found after their disappearance. The film's website bolstered this approach by featuring fake police reports and newsreel-style interview footage, and the filmmakers themselves referred to the movie as being factual, with flyers even being distributed at film festivals urging people to come forward if they had any information about the missing subjects of the film. It all felt very real, this. A documentary on the legend of the Blair Witch was even released in time for the release of the film. There was no Wikipedia in those days, no easy Google to set people people's minds at ease. The debate the movie sparked was unreal. For months afterwards, people speculated about the provenance of the film and whether it was genuine footage or not. And it remains one of the most profitable movies of all time. Number three, Genre Lies, Long Day's Journey Into Night. Released in 2018 to rave reviews, B. Garn's uncompromisingly art house movie, Long Day's Journey Into Night, is not an easy watch. Well over two hours long, one hour of which is taken up with an audacious patience testing single take dream sequence, the film was made for movie and art buffs by movie and art buffs. So how on earth did it manage to debut with a haul of $38 million in its native China, beating box office hit Venom into second place? By trickery, it turns out. Gan marketed his movie as a date movie. Released on New Year's Eve, the idea was that the film's star-crossed lovers would kiss at the climax at precisely midnight, allowing couples in the audience to join them in a cross-year kiss of their own. Much of the audience who fell for this not-altogether-ethical marketing gimmick lived outside of China major urban centres, and were fairly easy to manipulate like this, and they were not impressed. Many walked out or fell asleep early on, and three quarters of the audience left comments online slating the movie and claiming they'd been tricked and would never have spent money on the film had they known what it was really like. Even Garn himself admitted that mainstream audiences were unlikely to enjoy his movie or pay to see it. Not without you tricking them into going, Garn, no. Number two, using fake people, Rolling Thunder Review, a Bob Dylan story. A lifelong fan of the extraordinary genius of Orson Welles, as almost every serious filmmaker is, Martin Scorsese seemed to have followed in his idol's footsteps a little, with 2019's rock and roll documentary Rolling Thunder Review, a Bob Dylan story. His second movie about Dylan following 2005's No Direction Home, Rolling Thunder Review incorporates interviews with the people and performers involved with Dylan's 1975 Rolling Thunder Review tour. People like Joe Bays, Ronnie Hawkins, Ramblin' Jack Elliott, Sam Shepard, and Dylan himself, as well as some archival footage. It also features interviews with people who didn't exist, talking about things that did not happen. Rolling Thunder Review's talking head segments with filmmaker Stefan Van Dorp and Jack Tanner are entirely fictional. The former is played by performance artist Martin Von Hasselberg, while the latter is Michael Murphy, who played the character 30 years ago in Robert Altman's seminal mockumentary miniseries Tanner 88. To complicate things further, Sharon Stone's interviews are a pack of lies too. She's playing a fictionalized version of herself, running a script to camera. 
Scorsese's film doesn't distinguish between the genuine interviewees and the fictitious ones, or between events that happened and those that just didn't. The result is a film that actually upset some people, who consider that they were themselves tricked by Scorsese. Conned into accepting the film as a representation of the truth of a moment in the past that they have some investment in. They were not happy with Marty. Number one, a real life haunting, Ghostwatch. A drama shot in the style of a live news special, Ghostwatch blew everyone away when it was first shown on British television on Halloween 1992. So much so that it's not been repeated ever since. Written by Leslie Manning and directed by Stephen Volk, the program saw real life BBC reporters supposedly investigate a poltergeist in a house in London. Cutting between live feeds and studio talking heads, the program pieced together the history of a ghost nicknamed Pipes, after a mother's explanation for all the odd noises heard at night. Gradually, the spectre manifested in more and more frightening ways, until the reporters finally figured out what was happening. Like some massive networked seance, the live television report broadcast to millions across the UK was boosting the poltergeist power until it was capable of escaping the house by means of the camera feed, possessing the BBC studios and broadcasting itself to the entire country. It sounds like the plot of a Supernatural episode, but the tried and trusted live documentary slash news format of the show, combined with the use of non-actors like legendary broadcaster Michael Parkinson, who gamely played it completely straight, absolutely freaked out a large proportion of the audience at home. Incredibly, the BBC received 30,000 calls in a single hour, convinced that terrifying, unexplainable things were absolutely occurring. There's no way the trick could ever be repeated these days. Modern audiences, made cynical by decades of reality TV, are convinced that everything they see on TV is just rigged. Still, for one evening there, a quarter of a century ago, television made people believe in the vengeful afterlife. Spooky stuff.